He's on the ground, bleeding out of his head. Oh my God. New details emerging about the day that Robert Limon was killed at a Tehachapi rail yard. He was the best guy ever. He would help anybody. He didn't do this. I know that. She's an amazing mother, amazing person. She would never do anything like this. Sabrina married to Robert, but having an affair with Jonathan. Yes, I had the best of both worlds. Both Sabrina and Hearn bought burner phones to avoid detection. That's when the darker conversations began. I had 80 text messages incoming and outgoing to Jonathan Hearn. I was having an affair. There's really no explanation for my behaviors. I can see how that looks really, really good. It had everything. It had sex, religion, all these secrets. People during the day, all day, were watching this trial. The case became even more explosive after Hearn agreed to testify against his former lover, Sabrina Lamone, in exchange for a plea deal. I was definitely uh, armed to kill him. A scandalous trial from day one. Robert and Sabrina decided to get involved in what we call an open marriage. They got involved with wife swapping, partner swapping. Claims that blew up the comment section. My wife and I and Rob and Sabrina um, would engage in sexual activities. Highlighting the swingers lifestyle. It's a lifestyle that I don't expect people to understand. I'm holding a microphone because of the situation that I'm in. It's different. And because of that, this is what I'm doing. I hope this doesn't bother you. It's only going to be for this video. Today, I want to talk about what happened to Robert Lamone. So Robert was actually shot dead at his job. And at first it looked like um, a robbery, but then uh, secrets of his personal life came out and it was discovered that this was no random robbery. This was a personal targeted attack. And the more we found out about the case, the more bizarre it got. There's like a lone wolf and he tried to join the wolf pack and it all went crazy. And so I want to really tell you the story. And the thing about this case is that it is scandalous. Okay. It's, we're talking about a small town where you know they're religious and very family oriented and you've got these swingers and murderers and they're all using religion to justify it so bear with me a quick word for the sponsor from the sponsor this video is sponsored by every plate as you guys know every plate have been supporting my channel for months now and i love when i get my every plate box it's a meal delivery kit but it's 25 percent cheaper than grocery shopping it's one of the most affordable meal delivery Delivery kits and it's under the umbrella of HelloFresh so you know you're going to get that quality and the great recipes but since they're simpler they're quicker and also more affordable. I love the recipe that I made this time. This one was like a gooey burger with like cheese stuffed inside and then there were caramelized onions and the potato buns with the potato wedges oh my god it was so good now another cool thing about every plate is that it prioritizes sustainability it actually offsets 100 percent of their carbon footprint and their meals have 31 percent lower carbon footprint carbon carbon footprint on average than supermarket meals of the same portion Okay. Another thing I love is the variety. You don't, you're not going to get stuck in a rut like sometimes that happens with me. They have 25 affordable recipes to choose from each week and you're always able to find something new. And even if you find something and you want to swap out a protein or a side or add protein or veggie to something, you can. So if you're interested, get $1.49 per meal by going to everyplate.com and entering the code NUR149. So getting started with EveryPlate is just $1.49 per meal. Go to everyplate.com and enter the code NUR149. Thank you so much for watching and thank you to every plate for supporting my channel. Back to the video. It all started when Robert S Limone, almost said Simone, when Robert Simone is, I said Simone again, when Robert, so it all, <clears throat> so it all started when Robert Limone and his wife Sabrina decided to open up their relationship. Now the thing about it was 
According to Sabrina, she did not want an open relationship, but she went along with it to make Robert happy. And they were in this community. It was called Silver Lakes. And it was like this mirage because it was a fake lake in the desert, basically, of California. And it was this community where they all were very tight knit. Uh, it was a very conservative vibes. And so it wouldn't really go with the flow. Uh, why am I rhyming? I, I, once. So they kept it a secret. But the thing was, there were several families within that community of Silver Lakes that called themselves the Wolf Pack. Okay. Now the Wolf Pack were swingers. And it depends who you ask what they did. My wife and I and Rob and Sabrina, um, would engage in sexual activities, but it was not wife swapping. It was more girls, and Rob never had sex with Kelly, and I never had sex with Sabrina. It was usually Sabrina and I, and then we would go have sex with our husbands. And then Sabrina was like, no, you know, my husband would make me sleep with other men, and he would sleep with their wives. So. I don't know. They were swinging one way or another. They swung somehow. So what they would do is this, the wolf pack, they would go on these trips, vacations, and they would all go together. They would party a lot and they would swing. And this became sort of like a routine for them. They had certain trips that they would go to certain times of the year and they all hung out and then they would come back to Silver Lakes and pretend like everything was fine, go to church, go to school, PTA meetings, whatever. And that, that's what they did until something happened. According to Sabrina, Kelly, her friend, and Robert, her husband, were having a secret affair outside of the swinging parties. It started out secret, but then she felt like he would kind of brag about certain things that he did with Kelly, be like, oh my God, Kelly did this amazing thing. And she would be like, I don't wanna hear about this. And he was like, whatever. Her husband, Robert, worked on the railroad in Tachapi, which is not too far, like an hour or so from where they lived. And she worked at the local Costco part-time and she was like the person who hands out the samples, you know, when you go to Costco and the samples. So she meets this guy when she's handing out samples. This guy is Jonathan. Jonathan is like 11 years younger than her. He's very sheltered. They say he's like from a very religious home. He was homeschooled. Uh, he was well-educated, but very like sort of naive to the ways of the world. And he was working at the fire station. And part of his duties was to go to Costco and buy food that they would cook. So he's there in Costco. So is Sabrina. He goes to ask for a sample. They hit it off. They have some sort of banter and some way somehow he gets sabrina's phone number um he gets sabrina's phone number he texts her sabrina says she tells him and he admits to this that she tells him right away that she's married she also mentions you know the whole swinging thing she does say however that like i actually don't want to do this i'm just doing this to make my husband happy but it's like it's not really my vibe and i and jonathan tells her like i would never do something to you. You, you're all I need. I would never need another woman. Like, I would just never do this to you. And it's a shame that you're having to deal with this. So she says that from there, she kind of was getting like this attention that she didn't get from her husband. And, and, and he was saying things that she wanted to hear. And so she says that they would talk a lot for a couple of months. But then after a few months, the relationship went to the next level. And it was sexual and she was basically full-blown having an affair well this is when things go to yet another level because guess what remember the couple i told you about earlier kelly and her husband his name is jason so kelly and jason were already part of the wolf pack and they were swinging with robert and sabrina are you with me now guess what jason kelly's husband he also works at the fire station where who works Jonathan, the guy Sabrina's having an affair with at the Costco. Okay, I'm gonna put pictures because you can get confused. I, I, I got confused. Jonathan, okay, finds out one day that like Jason, his friend from the firehouse is hanging out 
with Robert and Sabrina, the woman he's having an affair with, and they're at some bar having drinks, and he wants to stop by, say hi or whatever. He's already having this affair with Sabrina. So Jason's like, yeah, come over. So he stops by, he says hi, they're all hanging out, he meets her husband, everyone, and then he sort of starts telling Jason like, hey, I had so much fun. Like basically, can I be part of the wolf pack? Like invite me, I want to do these things with you. And Jason's like, sure, okay, whatever. And then it just, it starts getting even messier from there. There was this incident that happened where Robert found out that Sabrina was having an affair with him. So Robert goes to Jason and Kelly's home. They needed some help remodeling and he's helping them remodel. While Robert is there, Jonathan, the guy having an affair, 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 affair with his wife, is calling Jason, the go-between guy, like blowing up his phone. And he's like, I know you're there with Robert. Like, I want to speak to Robert. So Jason is on the phone with Jonathan and he tells Robert, like, hey, I don't know how to tell you this, man, but like he says he's sleeping with your wife. And Robert goes, I know this already. And Jason's like, what? And he's like, yeah. Give me the phone. So he takes the phone and now he's talking to Jonathan and he basically tells Jonathan, listen, I know about your affair with my wife and stay away from her. Like it's over between you two. It's done. Like whatever. We're moving forward. We don't want anything to do with you. The thing is, that's not what happened. Now, according to Sabrina, when she did a police interview, she said that the way Robert found out about this affair was that they were drunk and like her phone was somewhere and he like saw a text from Jonathan and like confronted her about it. I found my phone. Tell me about that. And who was not You know, he was like, who's, who's this dude? And, and he'd seen him out once before. He'd only uh, met him once. So he was just like, you know, what's up? How did this, how did this go down? And um, I just kind of told him like, I don't, I, I don't know. It just happened. And uh, Jonathan apologized to Robert. Talked to him. He apologized to him. And we felt bad, you know. thing about it is uh, Jonathan and Sabrina never stopped talking they didn't listen to Rob instead now Sabrina is making jokes being like man it would be great if like my husband like was out of the picture like if he was dead it would be great and according to Jonathan it started out as a joke and that joke kind of turned into like well like if we did do it, like, how would we do it? And then it sort of escalated from there because according to Jonathan, Sabrina said that divorce wasn't an option. Now, according to him, she told him that, like, Robert would rather die than be divorced from me. And also, it really wouldn't look good in the community and it would ruin my image. For the timeline, I just want you to know that Robert and Sabrina got married in 2000. They opened up their marriage in 2008. And around 2012, 2013, like late, early, depends. I found different things in different articles. Around that time is when uh, Sabrina met Jonathan. So 
about a couple months from after they meet and all this happens is when they start talking about killing Robert just so you get an idea of the timeline. At this point, remember Jason, the, the friend who knows everything, he was obviously aware of what happened and he knew that like Sabrina and Jonathan were not supposed to be talking and that Robert told him to, to get away from her. A year after that call and that conversation that happened at his home, he was at the Costco, the same Costco where Sabrina hands out samples where she met Jonathan and he sees Sabrina and Jonathan at that Costco flirting with each other. And so he, the friend, like being Robert's good friend, he goes up to Jonathan and he's like, you're not supposed to be talking to Robert's wife. And he basically, they exchange words and Jonathan was like, we're just friends. And Jason was like, I don't care. Like, I don't ever want to see you step foot in this Costco. And so... I don't know. The thing with Jonathan is he would be like, okay, no, we're good, we're good, we're good, we're good. But then he'd continue doing whatever he wanted to do. Anyway, a few months after this incident in Costco, Robert would end up dead. A few days after his 38th birthday, he was shot dead at his job at that railroad in Tehachapi. Someone shot him twice, ransacked the office, and then left. And this was around 5 p.m. Sabrina was actually texting him during this time. It says, Bear, I hope you're having a good day. I'm going to my mom's to visit for a bit. Call me on my cell. Love you, responder Rob with uh, three happy faces. It says, call me bear. I'm home now, getting the kids dinner and ready for school, yay. About 30 minutes later, Sabrina starts calling Robert's cell phone. A total of 17 missed calls were on Robert's phone between 7.30 and nearly 8.30 at night. Babe, I'm worried about you. Call me. Leanna wants to say goodnight. And he never responds. And so then uh, someone calls 911. That's exactly what happened. I opened the garage door and the light bulb busted out. Robert was shot twice. The first shot, it exited his neck, like it went through his face and exited his neck. And the second shot went through his jaw and the bullet got lodged in his brain. And the gun that was used was a large caliber, like 44 or 45. Really, they did not have much physical evidence at the scene other than that. Later on, they would look at the surveillance and that's when they would get their other major piece of evidence, which was this person who was there around the time, who was walking with a limp, who was pretty covered in the face, wearing a helmet. And this person was also on a motorcycle and they could make out some features of the motorcycle. And after looking at all the different people who came and went, they determined that their suspect was probably this person who was driving the motorcycle. At this time, they're still operating on the idea that this was a robbery because the person came in and they seemed to ransack the office and look for something. And they didn't really know of anyone who would want to hurt Robert. But then 12 days after the murder, they get a phone call from Jason. Robert's friend, and he tells them, listen, something weird is going on. This this guy, his name is Jonathan. He's actually had an affair with Robert's wife, and he's sending me weird text messages, and he's calling me, and he's saying weird things. According to Jason, Jonathan wanted to meet up face-to-face -face with him and his wife, Kelly, and he wanted to apologize to them. He said that he wanted to get right with God and clear his conscience, conscience, sorry, and ask for forgiveness for his shameful behavior. So Jason is like, wait a minute, who has incentive to kill Robert? You know, this guy's having an affair with his wife, like they would benefit from Robert being gone. And he's like wanting to ask for forgiveness and he's done some wrong, horrible things. And so they started to wonder, oh my God, did Jonathan kill Robert? But then the question that came after that was, well, does Sabrina have any, anything to do with this? And it was interesting because Jason was like, no, there's no way Sabrina could. But Kelly, remember Kelly, the one who was supposedly sleeping with Robert, Sabrina's husband, she tells police, actually, I think Sabrina's in on it. I believe she told Jonathan to shoot Rob. And that's because you care about her husband so deeply, right? I believe I cared about him more than she did. Jason and Kelly 
told cops about this whole wolf pack swinging thing and their involvement in it and what happened with Jonathan. Like they filled them in on the whole thing. But Sabrina is still denying any of this and keeping up the facade. And so they decide to tap her phone. We immediately started thinking this could be a great case for a wiretap. Whatever happens, well, however it goes, I just love you. I love you. I love you. To the end, to the end of the world, I love you. So, um, I love you back. I want to be used for his glory. Whatever he wants me to do, I mean, I would tap my arm up, I would shave my head, I would, if, if that's, like, what God would want for me, you know, like, I feel that. I do too. I do too. Hi, God. We're on our knees for a reason. God. We have been dirtbags. We've been sinners. We've been selfish. We've sinned. In addition to recordings of Sabrina and Jonathan after Robert died, which were kind of suspicious or very suspicious, they also were able to get like the records of calls that happened between them before Robert was killed, and it was a lot. They also found that several months before Robert was killed, Jonathan stopped calling and texting insane amounts of text messages to Sabrina, but then he started the next day texting that same volume to a burner phone. That looks suspicious. Why are you texting this burner phone? Like, why did she switch to a burner phone? What are you hiding? And the second thing is, this is probably still Sabrina, but now you guys are trying to hide your communications. And then months after this, Robert winds up dead. So then you have the conversations between them after Robert's death when the police are doing the investigation. And it was like every single time the cops called Sabrina for anything, giving her an update, asking her questions, whatever, literally minutes after she gets off the phone with police she calls jonathan and she gives him an update but here's the thing on the day of the murder there was no calls and texts between them for that day jonathan like turned off his phone for pretty much the whole day and it was just like odd compared to all the other communications they had so at this point police are like okay they're having an affair they probably planned to kill Robert so that she could get the insurance money and he could get out of the way and she could still keep up appearances like that she didn't get a divorce and all that and that they were going to be together. So the weird part about this whole dynamic is that like there's a lot of sinning going on here by typical Christian standards like you're talking about the swinging and the murder and the lying and all this stuff and yet they are using religion to justify what they're doing. Okay, it reminds me so much of the Lori Vallow thing where they're like, this is for like God. This is, we're, do, we're, we're having an affair for God. They were talking about like their relationship being God's purpose and how this was essentially like a murder for God's purpose. Like they would pray like, please help her like, to be strong and, and during the interrogation and like not stumble over her words and he kept saying things like oh i've been a bad boy like we deserve a spanking and like weird shit and they talked about once he's dead they would raise the kids together like for christ then he talks about this certain um story in the bible about david and Bathsheba, i think where he like kills her husband and god forgave him and they're like likening th themselves to this. I've been reading Psalms 51. The Psalms are so good. David yes. is a lot like you and I, Sabrina. He was someone who committed adultery. Actually, that's what Psalm 51 is about. He had an affair and then he even went on to kill the guy, like send him into battle and pretty much had him killed off. So there comes this turning point in their calls where it seems like they're getting paranoid because remember, Sabrina is calling Jonathan every time she gets off the phone with police with like, oh, this is what they said, this is the update. And there was one time where the police give her an update like, oh, we found some sweat. Uh, we're going to test it for DNA on the site. And she calls to tell him that. And for some reason, he feels like 
paranoid about it. He's like, wait, I feel like they're listening to our calls. So they change the whole tone of their calls and they start being like, man, we really hope this gets solved. Like this is probably a random attack. Like this is probably a financially motivated random attack. And they're like uh, cre creating fake conversations that don't even make sense with the ones they were having before uh, because it seems like they think they're phone is being tapped which it is and then you can hear jonathan talking about oh my god there's a car parked outside i think there's a car stuck me like he constantly thought he was about to get arrested that they were onto him he was freaking out sabrina seemed like she was feeling guilty too there's one quote that i found where she tells jonathan on one of these calls because they were like so many calls but this one she says i have to be a good girl i feel that more than ever i have to be a good girl for him he is like my father i want to be a good girl god i want to be be a good girl and I have been a bad girl. I feel like the most horrible person in the world. Then something happened. The police get a break in the case. They are tracing the motorcycle and the footage of the guy with the helmet and they find out that Jonathan has a similar motorcycle to the one there. They get a search warrant for his home. They find that he has similar caliber uh, weapons that has the murder weapon. And there's all these things he's saying that seem to be consciousness of guilt on the tapped phone calls. So they're like, all right, we have enough to arrest them. And they end up arresting Jonathan and Sabrina. They arrest Jonathan. Sabrina gets arrested on her way to like a parent teacher conference. Now, the odd thing here is that they end up releasing Sabrina because they had not enough evidence. Like they couldn't prove that she knew Jonathan was going to do it or that she wanted Jonathan to do it. So they let Sabrina go and Jonathan is arrested. He pleads not guilty and now he's waiting for his trial. Well, a few days before his trial is about to start, he meets up with the prosecutors and he tells them, I'm going to talk. I'm going to turn on Sabrina. Like she is the one who asked me to do this. I did this for Sabrina and that's who police really wanted. And so they end up giving him a plea deal where instead of him getting a life sentence, he gets 25 years, but the possibility of parole sooner than that, if he decides to testify against Sabrina, which he does. At this point, he's like found God again um, in the prison and he's like teaching and, and he just completely apparently changed his life and felt horrible about what he did and was going to try to make it right by testifying against Sabrina. So Sabrina, who thought she was going to testify against Jonathan a few days before the trial, she ends up getting arrested and then finds out that now he flipped on her and she's on trial. So it's crazy. Did you know that he had planned to murder your husband? So basically, Jonathan, he pled guilty to voluntary manslaughter and Sabrina was now on trial for charges of first degree murder, conspiracy to commit murder, solicitation to commit murder, attempted murder, accessory to murder, and mingling harmful substances with food and drink. So now it's time for Sabrina's trial because she pled not guilty and Jonathan takes the stand and he tells it all. Hearn testified that Sabrina Lamone and Hearn started with texting and phone calls, leading to pictures, including nude pictures, and eventually to sex. I had a frank disgust for him that was developing. Hearn writing in a note, please kill him God, during his frustration. As ironic and sad as this sounds, uh, for Rob's sake, um, she expressed that he would honestly rather be dead then divorced. I really didn't want to leave him if he wasn't uh, entirely dead. So I went back around the backside 
of the truck and um, quickly fired one more shot at him. He says, listen, actually, this shooting wasn't the first time we tried to kill him. We tried to kill him by poisoning his banana pudding. Apparently, that's his favorite dessert. Uh, she asked me how, how I thought would be best, and we discussed, uh, I believe, car accident and fire and quickly uh, skipped over those and arrived at poisoning. Sabrina took poison that Jonathan had mixed up like arsenic and stuff and put it in the pudding. And then she freaked out because she thought that the pudding would be traced back to her. So she calls Robert while he's at work and like the bananas have gone bad, they're rotten, like toss it out, don't eat it, which he does. And then they come up with the idea of he needs to be shot at work. And that is because we can disguise it as a robbery. She's now eligible to get benefits and a payout because he died on the job and it's like one of those jobs with a lot of risks so there's good benefits so in her mind she's like we can make money off of his death and this is the best idea so they go ahead with this plan according to jonathan sabrina is the one who told him like this is where he works this is what time is a good time like go this day go to this place like she gave him all the information he would need to do it and that he called her afterwards um, on her burner phone and told her it was done and they were happy they thought they had gotten away with it and that's when they would have all these conversations about like god and murder for god's purpose and all that shit and then it was time for sabrina to take the stand now sabrina's defense was basically that she was manipulated by Jonathan, that he was basically doing this all on his own. He was jealous and controlling. He wanted her husband out of the picture. She didn't want Robert out of the picture. She wanted sort of both of them and that he did this all on his own and that she's like feeble and uneducated and doesn't really know much. So the sad thing here is the kids because Robert and Sabrina had two kids and the two kids took the stand and they basically were supporting their mom. They live with their mom's sister, their aunt, and they stopped keeping in touch with their father's side of the family, which is sad because they feel like the father's side are accusing their mom of murder and they don't think she did it. As the families left the courtroom, there was a brief confrontation just outside the doors that had to be broken up by the bailiff. But once outside the courthouse, both sides turned the focus towards the children. And it's the kids that suffer so bad. I just I just hope one day we get to be a part of Robbie and Leanna's life. You know, they're, they're the ones that are suffering in the long term. Sabrina's defense were like, listen, the only evidence against Sabrina is this guy's word. And he has incentive to lie. He's got a heavy sentence and he, we know he did it. There's evidence against him. He's turning on her so that he can get a lighter sentence. And like, can we really trust this guy? But, you know, it was one of those things where it's up for the jury to decide who seemed more trustworthy. So after all was said and done, it was time for the jury to deliberate. And they took just a several hours. I think it was, what was it? Three hours? No, roughly five hours. That was off very off to come back with a guilty verdict for Sabrina on all the major charges. They didn't charge her with like food poisoning and mingling poison because I guess she called him and told him not to eat it anymore. But they did find her to be the one who planned and influenced Jonathan to kill her husband. And she ends up getting 25 years to life. First count. We the jury and panel to try the above entitled cause find the defendant Sabrina Limon guilty of a felony to wit, murder of Robert Lamont in violation of section 187 sub A of the penal code as charged in the first count of the information and do hereby fix the degree as murder in the first degree. Signed by the four person. Finding on penal code section 189. We the jury and panel to try the above entitled cause find it to be true as to Sabrina Lamont that the crime was done with premeditation and deliberation within the meaning of penal code section 189 as alleged in the first count of the information signed by the four person during the sentencing jonathan was like so remorseful like apologizing to everyone the world the family the kids i destroyed everything um and it turns out 2028 which really isn't that far away from now he will be eligible for parole and they're saying he's doing really well so he could get out pretty soon. 
versus Sabrina, she tried to appeal and say all kinds of reasons for the appeal that she didn't have good representation. She said there was prosecutors prosecutorial misconduct, insufficient evidence, and that the jurors were exposed to extensive media coverage and that the testimony from Jonathan was not corroborated. But the appellate court were basically like, um, no, we don't think any of that is true. We're going to uphold the verdict. Lamone's attorney, Sharon Beth Marshall, making a final plea for a new trial, saying that Lamone's prior attorney didn't adequately defend or prepare her. Motion for new trial is denied. 25 years to life on both murder and conspiracy. Never, Never getting out. So that is the story of the wolf pack, the swinging wolf pack. But anyway, let me know what you guys think. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you to every plate again for supporting my channel. And I will see you guys in the next video. Bye. Bye.